Yeah, welcome back to this um, yeah, invited talk, keynote speech by Jan Kautz. Jan Kautz is Vice President of Learning and Perception Research at NVIDIA. Um, before he came to NVIDIA, he actually was a professor, um, a tenure professor at the University College of London. He started studying computer science at the University of Erlangen in Nuremberg. That's the time where we both actually met and then also acquired a, a Master of uh, Math actually from the University of Waterloo, uh, received his PhD from the Max Planck Institute in uh, Saarbrücken and later on also was a postdoc at the MIT. Um, Jan Kautz is famous for quite a number of things. So uh, in his earlier career, um, he was um, in the graphics community, famous for uh, pre-computed radiance transfer, that is real-time graphics, um, and then also started his work on image processing, particularly high dynamic range imaging and exposure fusion, which was a very simple approach to um, create nice HDR images. Uh, right now, Jan leads the learning and perception research team at NVIDIA, which is situated both on the east and the west coast, um, and that group uh, mostly works on computer vision approaches um, as well as machine learning problems and combines them in, um, in the full spectrum of both looking into um, yeah, the inner workings of some machine learning approaches, um, low level computer vision, um, geometry estimation, as well as to high level vision problems. Um, for his work, he actually yeah, got quite a number of awards. So um, to begin with, the Young Researcher Award of Eurographics in 2007, and the latest works actually on uh, yeah, optical flow calculations, the PWC net, for example, one, for example, the Robust Vision Challenge, um, as well as um, yeah, on the workshop on autonomous driving, um, he got the first place, or his group got the first place on domain adaptation and semantic segmentation. So with all that, uh, I'm really, really happy that Jan joins us here today and gives this presentation. Of course, everything was planned differently of having him here in person, but I think we now have to look at this situation. I'm looking forward to this talk on uh, what you can do with generative adversarial uh, neural networks and everything surrounding. It's your floor. Thank you. Thank you, Hendrik, for the very nice introduction. Good morning, everybody. I'm really delighted to be here and to talk about our work on generative models for image synthesis. Um, and before I really start, I'd like to thank the organizers and, and Hendrik in particular for inviting me here um, to give a keynote. As Hendrik already said, yeah, it would have been really nice to come in person. I have fond memories of tubing in, and it would have been nice to yeah, talk to many of you and, and catch up with you. Um, it'll have to be another time, so it'll be, it'll be virtual uh, for now. <clears throat> right, so, so before I uh, yeah, talk more about the technical parts, uh, I wanted to give sort of a quick introduction of, of sort of what got me here, and, and Hendrik already you know, alluded to parts of it um, during his introduction. So I started out learning about computer graphics at the University of Erlangen. In fact, um, my first graphics lecture uh, or course was by Tom Ertl. Um, and, and I liked, yeah, I liked graphics so much that then yeah, embarked on a PhD in, in the area of real-time rendering with, with Hans Peter Seidel. Um, and then after a you know, few stops in, in Canada and US, I, I ended up um, in London where my research shifted more towards computational photography. And then yeah, after a few years, I, I joined NVIDIA where, where my research shifted again uh, more towards computer vision and AI, uh, which is what I've been working on for the last you know, five, six years or so. But in some sense, I've actually come full circle because you know, my group started again to look at image synthesis just from a very different angle, you know, so from the angle of AI. And this is what I'd like to tell you about today. So I'm sure you're all well aware of, of, sort of a traditional graphics pipeline where you, know, you start with a mesh, um, yeah, it could be a NURBS or triangles, whatever it is, um, and you you know, move them around by hand. An artist usually does this, and then you need to assign materials 
to it, and then you, you know, animate. Yeah, if it's if it's a character, then you have to animate the character, and finally you get to render. Um, yeah, your mesh, which could be ray tracing or rasterization, uh, whatever it is. And this is sort of how most of of content or three D content is being created today. And it's been hugely successful, right? It's used yeah, in games, obviously, media entertainment, simulation, uh, and so forth. So, so it's been a huge success, this traditional graphics pipeline. Of course, it's also, in, in some sense, a challenging pipeline, at least to create content, right? It's very labor intensive, uh, and, and you need you know, very specialized tools and, and people with very specific skills to do this. So our, our question was, can we sort of help creators um, maybe with better tools that are supported by AI to make this process maybe a bit easier or, or less labor intensive. Or to phrase it differently, we asked ourselves the question, can we learn to synthesize images as opposed to sort of hand crafting assets? So is there a way to use machine learning to synthesize realistic looking images? And, and this is what we sometimes call neural image synthesis. And, and I'll show some of our recent progress on both image and video synthesis. And the way we would like to do it is to learn this from data uh, as opposed to handcrafting things. And learning from data can mean different things. And, and uh, I'll talk both about supervised as well as unsupervised uh, methods to learn from data. So, you can ask why why do this at all, right? I, I mentioned one use case, which is content creation, yeah, providing new artistic tools. There's other uh, reasons why we might want to do this. We might want to do this in order to create training data um, for other algorithms, right? So we so we don't need to to collect a lot of training data, but instead we can synthesize training data. That would be uh, very useful. And it turns out we can actually take some of these learnings and even apply it to very different problems such as segmentation. I'll show an example um, of that at the end. So much of my talk today, um, or almost all of it, will use uh, GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks. And uh, probably many of you have heard of them, but nonetheless, I'd like to give a quick introduction of, of what they're all about and how they work. So GANs um, are you know, basically two neural networks and the goal of the first neural network, the so-called generator, is to synthesize an image. Could be other things of, as well, of course, but in this case, you know, the, the goal of, of the generator is to synthesize an image. And it, it does this based on some latent vector Z, which is some high dimension, some, uh, this is basically a vector of you know, whatever, 128 um, numbers or you know, something along those lines. Then the generator takes this and outputs some image. And the goal of the generator is to output images that are similar to a training set. So the probability of a generator outputting a particular image should be the same as the probability of this image existing in the training set. Then there's a discriminator and the discriminator's role is to tell whether the output of the generator is a synthesized image or if it comes from the real training set. And yeah, you know, that's a discriminator's role. So there's two networks, and you train them in sort of in a ping pong fashion. And if you train this in this, if you train them in this ping pong fashion, the discriminator over time learns to distinguish yeah you know, these fake images from real images. And at the beginning, it's easy, right? Because the generator has no idea what what to do. But then, yeah, you know, with the feedback from the discriminator, the generator over time learns to synthesize images that are more that look more like training set. And training set can be things like. Yeah, images of a car driving around, which is you know, what is shown here. So this, this is again, and it's been super successful over the last yeah, few years, right? They were invented or first proposed in 2014. And since then we've come really a long way. This is an example of, of work by um, Karas et al, who are also at NVIDIA. This is called uh, StyleGAN2, where the network has basically learned to synthesize very realistic looking images of faces. And you know, if, if you were shown a face like this, you, you could not tell whether this is a real face, a real photograph, or if it's synthesized by a neural network. It's gotten so good that it's really impossible or nearly impossible to distinguish these from real photographs. So it's very impressive. Now, if you, if you use a GAN, the way I described it, um, you get really great looking results. However, you don't have a lot of 
control, right? Remember that the input to the GAN is this latent vector is Z, right? It's just a bunch of numbers and that controls what you get out. So these numbers have an influence on the output, but the influence of, of each individual number is not always necessarily very clear or interpretable. So the question is, can we condition this on the GAN on some user input to make it more controllable? And this is where conditional GANs come in. So in a conditional GAN, it works very similar to the GAN before, except the input is not you know, this random vector of, of numbers Z, but instead it's an image and the generator you know, does something based on the image and outputs sort of a, another image um, based on this input. And you know, the task could be, for instance, you, you wanna yeah, input an image of, of nighttime and you wanna output an image that corresponds to it, but of daytime, right? That would be sort of a task that a conditional GAN uh, can do if, if you do it right. So really, th this is sort of a way of enabling sort of imagination abilities. And I put this in quote because, of course, it's, it's a machine. It doesn't really have imagination abilities, but it sort of, it rather learns you know, from, from a lot of data what, what likely things um, are happening. So here's an example of an input image of a daytime image uh, of a daytime uh, driving scene. I want to find yeah, some mapping F that's conditioned on some training set that allows it, for instance, to synthesize an image of the same scene, but during a rainy day, right? Can we learn a translation like this just purely from data without ever explicitly telling yeah, the algorithm how, what corresponds to what, right? That, that's sort of the goal. Can we do this? Can we learn this mapping just purely from training data without explicitly telling yeah, the algorithm what to do? And, and why would I want to condition yeah, it on an input image as opposed to something else. Well, there's a lot of cases, use cases where, where you might want to sort of translate one image to another image that are sort of related and similar. So for instance, actually ma many common tasks can be phrased as such, such as you know, going from low res to high res, from blurry to sharp, or from an image to a painting, you know, from a synthetic image to a real image, you know, and so forth, daytime to nighttime, summer to winter. Right? There's lots of cases where yeah, you really want to take an image and translate it to either you know, sort of a slightly different image or a better image in some form. And the use cases you know, we're interested in uh, were things like semantic to real, daytime to nighttime, you know, summer to winter, and so forth. And I'll show an example of these um, in a moment. Furthermore, there's, and I'll already mentioned this briefly, there's two ways of, well, there's several ways, but there's, there's sort of two main ways of doing this or, or dealing with the training data. One is in a supervised fashion, which means I have paired training data. So I know what, what an input might be and I might, I don't know exactly what a corresponding target output might be. So for instance, input, I have images of edges of shoes in this example, right? But I also have to corresponding shoe that corresponds to the edges um, uh, uh, from my input. So that would be supervised, right? I have paired training data. Then there's the, the unsupervised uh, manner or where I have two distinct training sets. One is say images of someone driving around during the daytime. And then I have images of someone driving around in a similar area at nighttime, but I don't have them exactly paired, right? So there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between a daytime image and a nighttime image. Also it would be impossible to get, to get those, right? So this is the unsupervised version. And it's interesting to look at both uh, use, use cases. And then furthermore, what I've sort of shown at the moment is if you do this conditional GAN, um, by default, you would get sort of a single output, right? It would be sort of a unimodal output. Um, but there are cases where maybe there's multiple ways you wanna translate an image. So if I say I go from daytime to nighttime, well, maybe there's sort of different ways the nighttime might look like, where if I go from summer to winter, well, maybe there's more or less snow on the road, right? So there might be multiple translations that are all sort of going to winter, but maybe a slightly different um, sort of, yeah, um, snow coverage, for instance. So, so there's, there's reasons why, why you might want to do a multimodal translation. And this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about different methods that you know, sort of are multimodal and supervised or unsupervised, and they have all sort of different pros and cons. And you'll see um, what I mean by that when we go over them. So the first one 
that I'd like to talk about is, is pix to pix HD, which is a supervised method for image to image translation, but it is multimodal. So here the task that we set ourselves was the following. Can I take what we call a semantic label map? This is this, you know, this colorful image where each pixel has a label associated with it that someone can paint. And the label might mean here's a road, here's part of a car, here's a sidewalk and here's trees, here's a person, right? You can see the different colors where here, you know, the dark purple is for the road, the blue is for the cars and the green is for the trees and so forth. Now, can we have an algorithm that outputs and synthesizes an image that corresponds to the label that we've put down? This would be you know, sort of a classical image to image translation problem. And can we learn this? Well, yeah, in, in some ways uh, it's almost straightforward. So our work is based on what was called Pix to Pix by Solid all from 2017. And what they did is yeah, sort of almost obvious in hindsight where you take as input, as a input to the generator. So if the generator is conditioned on the semantic label map, right? And it generator's task is to output a realistic looking image that corresponds to this label map. In order for the discriminator to be able to ensure that the output corresponds to the label map, the discriminator now not just sees the output of the generator, but also the input label map. So you can actually you know, learn to check uh, whether the output corresponds to the label map. And this is trained in a supervised fashion. So you actually have you know, ground truth label maps and corresponding output um, for it. And then you can learn this and it works you know, very well. Pixapix has been, was very um, famous. And ours is sort of an, an improvement over it. We call it pix to pix HD. And one of the main uh, distinguishing features is that it is multimodal. So we first train it sort of in, a, in a regular fashion, but then after training, we look at the feature maps for each instance uh, or for each class that really, so for, for cars um, and for the road and so forth, we look at you know, the feature maps and we perform k-means clustering on those. So this is for features belong to the same semantic class. So we get sort of, you know, what are the, the top k clusters for cars, for instance, or for road, right? And then at inference time, we can pick sort of a cluster center when we synthesize the image. And with that, we can steer the synthesis towards different you know, styles, if you will. And I'll, I'll show examples of that in, in a second. In addition, we wanted to be able to synthesize larger images uh, or higher resolution images. That's what we call Pixabix HD. In order to do this, we, we use this course to find generator where we first train a generator at a lower resolution and then we train it fully. And then we add sort of bigger, larger resolution layers on the outside, you know, both at the beginning and, the, and at the end of the generator, and then train that um, sort of in, in two steps. And that really helps to, you know, with the training and it allows you to create you know, much larger uh, resolution images. Also to facilitate, to facilitate this, we use a multi-scale discriminator. Um, so we don't just look at one scale to distinguish for the discriminator to distinguish real between synthesized, but we do it at multiple scales. And we also use a robust objective, which is sort of like a VGG loss or a feature loss, uh, but we do this in the discriminator feature, in the discriminator's feature space. So we don't just compare pixels, but we also compare um, features in that space. And that, that also is, is very, very helpful. So what does this look like? So I, I hope this comes across uh, well on, on, on the stream. So here I'm showing different results where it's the same scene, but we're cycling through you know, different clusters to guide the synthesis towards sort of different styles. So if you look at the road, you can see it's two different ways of, or three different ways of pavement, then it switches to cobblestone and it switches back to pavement, right? And it's always the same semantic input or the semantic label map, but we use different styles on the output. And the same is, is done here to the car. You can see that the car gets different colors. That is because we, we pick different cluster centers that correspond to different colors um, of the car. So there's an example of, of the multimodality that we, we can achieve. And of course, we can also yeah, change labels. So in this case, um, we're changing the, 
the buildings to trees or the trees to buildings. And then we also change the sky uh, to be trees. But the rest of the scene remains the same, right? The road remains the road. Uh, the cars remain where they were. The, the people remain where they were. The sidewalk is in the same place. Just in the background, the buildings and the trees you know, get swapped around. And this is achieved by truly changing the label um, for those areas. But in the case, it still manages to synthesize realistic looking images for each label change. So this was Pixabix HD. It, it worked on individual images and, and it worked yeah, quite nicely. We then looked at an extension where we thought, can we apply this to video? So here's a video of a label map. Um, so it's the same as before, except it's a stream of label maps temporally. And as you can see, it's basically a driving scene, right? We're driving down the road. So the cars move and, and the backgrounds move and so forth because I'm driving forward. Now, can we take this and synthesize a video from it? Well, first thing we did, of course, we applied Pixabix HD on a frame by frame basis. And what happens then is that it flickers a lot. And it's not surprising, right? Because it's applied on a frame by frame basis. Pixabix HD was never told to pay attention to temporal coherence if it's applied in a sequence. So what happens is that, yeah, there's some flickering on the road, the colors of the cars might change slightly, uh, there's a lot of wobbling. Yeah, the windows on buildings aren't consistent over time because yeah, there isn't really anything to tell the algorithm where the windows should be and so forth. So it's, it's you know, flickering, which is not surprising. So can we fix this? So in, inspired by, by what we did for Pixel HD, we use sort of similar ideas, but extend them to videos. So the main loop uh, is sort of this sequential generator where the input now is not just one semantic map, but you know, a sequence of, of a couple semantic label maps. We also feed the past images that we've synthesized in. And this is sort of the, the main input. In addition, we create a flow map of sort of how things have moved over the past few frames, um, which we use to warp the previous synthesized frames sort of one step forward, because this is most likely what things will look like, right? Then we use our network to synthesize a yeah, sort of next frame. Then we have another network that sort of combines the warp previous frame and this, the now imagined new frame together to build sort of the, the next actual frame. The multi-scale discriminator that we had for images, we extend to videos. So we, we do the multi-scale dis discriminator, not just you know, sort of multiple scales over the image itself, but also temporally. So we look at you know, smaller and further temporal distances. Um, so that helps. And then we apply this spatial temporal progressive training. So we do not just synthesis, not just start with a smaller network in terms of resolution, but also in terms of time. And then over time, we sort of yeah, alternate between increasing the resolution of the network by adding more layers, but also increasing it temporally by synthesizing sort of further distances in, in time. So it's spatial as well as temporally progressive the way we train. And when we put this all together, we can actually yeah, arrive at something that is temporally consistent. So this is you know, the input label map, which then gets synthesized in a video stream. And now the video stream is temporally coherent. Uh, I hope again, this comes across on the stream. We know that the car colors do not shift over time. The buildings you know, are consistent. The road markings don't flicker, uh, but they're consistent on the road. The leaves in the trees don't flicker, but they're consistent on the road. So that, that actually worked um, yeah, much better. There's a bit of a loss in terms of, sort of overall brightness uh, of the colors, right? And that is because you know, so it's easier, I guess, um, to synthesize sort of, yeah, to, to keep sort of the colors muted instead of having you know, something that, that's very bright and, and ensuring that it stays temporally coherent. So it, it tends to synthesize more muted colors for this particular example. We can still do the multimodal um, training uh, as before. So here we're going from edges to people, but we've trained on sort of multiple yeah, different people um, or multiple styles. And as a result, the network has learned uh, 
to translate not just to one person uh, or to one person, but with different hairstyles and skin tones. And, and the results are yeah very consistent temporally. And even though we apply different styles, it, it really is sort of the, the same person uh, talking except with different style. And then we can do things like you know, input a sort of virtual character to animate a real person. So here we've trained on, on, on a person dancing and now we can input new dances and translate you know, the frames, the colorful frames, which correspond sort of to a UV map over the body essentially and synthesize you know, this person uh, dancing. And then, yeah, for a demo, uh, we, we made this sort of an interactive uh, system where we can give user uh, control. So we did this, we hooked this up to a game engine. This game engine now doesn't output actual RGB pixels, but rather just labels uh, of the components that are shown in the scene. Then this label map is given to our, to our method, which synthesizes the RGB frame, and that's then uh, shown on screen. So th this is the result of this. So on the left, you see the output of the game engine. And on the right, you see what happens when you apply yeah, the image to image or video to video translation in this case. And this is interactive. So somebody can actually sit there and steer sort of through yeah, the city while yeah, and, and drive through the city and have AI synthesize the images. So let me play it through. So on the left, you have you know, the label map driving through and on the right, you have the corresponding synthesized images. And you know, it, it, here it actually works really, really nicely. And we, we managed to get this close to real time. So it really, yeah, people were, were able to sit down and you know, drive through yeah, the town and get results uh, like this, which was really nice. All right, so this was, uh, Pixel uh, HD and, and video to video translation. Then last year, um, my team worked on what we call Gaugan. So Gaugan is sort of really an artistic tool. Sorry, let me just let me stop this and turn off the audio. Okay. So what we see here is um, the the goal here was to take what we had done for Pix to Pix, but make it more of an artistic tool that's useful and works well in practice. So here, an artist can draw a semantic label map on the left and on the fly, the yeah, algorithm is run and you always see on the right side, the output of the current label map. So an artist can pick yeah, different labels and start drawing. So first thing that happens is, yeah, we're gonna change the bottom to ocean draw a little bit of a rock uh, there. I'm gonna draw little rocks in front and add a bigger mountain in the back. Then maybe add, yeah, and then cycle through different styles. Again, Gaugan supports different styles. And I'll explain in a minute how we, how we do all this. We add a little bit of beach. Again, cycling through different styles. Change the sand to gravel. Then yeah, let's draw a second scene. And this one, this one is quite interesting. <clears throat> so I'm gonna add a little bit of grass in the foreground, some clouds, sky, and a bit of a mountain in the background. Make the sky more cloudy. Again, cycling through different styles. Draw a tree. I can see, yeah, a synthesized tree. And now we're doing something interesting. We're going to add uh, a little, or we're going to make it, actually, we're going to change the front to snow. So now it looks more like a snowy uh, scene because the, the front grass was changed to snow. And then in a second, we're gonna, gonna add a little pond. Here we go. I'm gonna draw a little pond at the bottom. Once we fill it in, something interesting happens. And that is, even though we only drew a pond, right? The method actually has learned that the pond should reflect 
what's there, right? So it's learned that, well, if there's a tree above it, I should probably reflect the tree. And we never told it, right? It's just seen enough examples and realized that if there's a body of water, it should probably reflect what's you know, above it, right? And this is exactly what happened here. The pond uh, reflects the tree. Now I'll, I'll skip these, these are just uh, more examples. All right, so the, the architecture is different. So this was, yeah, after we had worked on, on this problem space for a while um, and, and the team came up with sort of a different architecture um, than before that, that better. And, and the main difference here is the discriminator. The discriminator has changed uh, quite a bit. We now have what we call spade uh, ResNet blocks that are fed in sort of in the middle of the network at multiple locations. So the input to the generator now is actually uh, not the image, not the semantic label map directly, but rather it's the style. So the style is given sort of as the main input uh, to the generator, so the generator is conditioned on the style. So there's already a big difference to before. And the other difference is that the semantic label map is fed sort of multiple times sort of into these spade resonant blocks, which then are sort of the, the way we use the information and propagate it um, to the output image. So what, what does a spade resonant block look like? Well, it's a bit like a resonant block, but with these new spade uh, layers in between. And the spade layer is very similar to batch norm layers. So a batch norm layer, what it does, it basically normalizes um, the features, right, by, by, by its mean invariance. Now, what we do here is a spatially adaptive um, norm that's learned. So it's basically a parameter, so it's basically um, sort of like a batch norm, except that we learn for each pixel or, or location of a feature, we learn a, a mean, um, sort of a, a bias and, and yeah, a scale that we apply at each location. And this is, and, and the way we learn it is that the semantic label map is given to a yeah, convolutional layer, which outputs the parameters, yeah, gamma and beta here, which then get applied to the current feature map. So it's very, very different um, than what we had done before, but this turns out to be very, very powerful. And you can try this yourself. So we put Gaugan uh, up on, on our web page. So it's a, it's, it's a web demo. You can go there and, and draw yeah, different label maps yourself and see what the algorithm produces. And, and I did some drawings yeah, uh, earlier. And it really is, is quite fun. And anyone can draw these. It's really, really quite, quite soothing, actually, once you start drawing. So on the left again, yeah, label apps, these are some that, that I drew. It's a, yeah, a lake, some grass, um, ma a hill, mountain, and some clouds. And again, you can see that, that it knows when there is a lake that it should reflect yeah, what's in the background. And, and what's interesting to note is actually that it learned that it should reflect what's in the background. It didn't quite exactly reflect what's there, right? It reflected sort of something that's similar to what's actually in the image, but it didn't reflect it exactly. But yeah, overall, if you look at this uh, at, at a first glance, you wouldn't even notice that it's not an, an accurate reflection, but it does a good job at, at making a, you know, a good impression of, of a reflection. If you have a beach scene, yeah, very easy, right? There's not a lot of labels that you need to draw to get a really nice uh, image out. Here's another mountain scene, again, um, with a little lake. And again, you can see how it's learned to synthesize um, yeah, nice trees, the mountain and, and the reflection. And here we did, we, we did an experiment where we took landscape images, we automatically derived uh, semantic labels um, from them. So we just ran uh, yeah, a semantic labeling network uh, to output semantic labels. Then we used those semantic labels and fed them into Gaugen to see what it would output and we sort of ask it to output different variations, different styles as well. So here is, uh, I'll take this one actually. First, so this is the ground truth input. This is the, what a, a semantic labeling method would give you automatically. Then we just feed this into Gaugen and we ask it to give it to give us different renditions. So it's basically the same as the ground truth image, but a different you know, in different styles, if you will. And the same for all these images. So if you look down here, it manages to resynthesize a tree um, and the landscape. It's actually very similar to the one that, that it was given, just yeah, 
uh, this one is more you know, sort of early spring where there isn't a lot of green yet and so forth. So it's actually an interesting way of taking an existing image and applying sort of different styles to this by going through Gaugan. Of course, we can apply it to different things. So here's for indoor scenes. So we use label maps of indoor scenes to train Gaugan. And this is a bit more difficult um, for Gaugan, but it still does you know, a decent job at, at synthesizing indoor images. But if you look closely, you can see that the things are slightly wobbly and maybe not fully realistic. Of course, we can apply it to faces as well. So here are different label maps, and we can synthesize yeah, faces based, based on those. So okay. anyway, not surprising. So that was Gaugan. It's been very successful. And yeah, there's a web app and, and a, or web demo, and I encourage you to try it out because it really is, it is quite fun um, to draw. So these were all trained in a supervised fashion, meaning we had you know, corresponding input to outputs. In this case, was always label map to realistic image. Um, so it's fairly easy to get correspondences because I can deduce a label map from, from an image fairly easily. But now we would like to look at the case where maybe it's not possible to get corresponding images. So can we look at the unsupervised case? And as I mentioned earlier, this actually comes up as a use case, um, because sometimes it's impossible to actually get corresponding images. So for instance, if I would like to translate from a daytime to a nighttime image, in order to train it in a supervised fashion, I would need to have you know, one to one corresponding daytime and nighttime images. So I would need to have put up my camera during the daytime, take a picture, wait until nighttime and take another picture and hope that nothing in the scene has moved. Right? For most scenes like outdoor scenes, that's impossible, right? Something will have moved, right? The leaves will have moved, cars will have moved, yeah, all kinds of things will have moved slightly, right? It's, it's nearly impossible to create a data set that has corresponding daytime and nighttime images, especially if you want more than five, right? If you want thousands of examples, you basically can't get data like this. However, what you can get, and that's fairly easy to create, is I can easily create or capture thousands of images of someone driving during the day and someone driving during the night in the same vicinity, right? So, so they're similar uh, in terms of content, except that one is during the day and one is during the night, but they're not in one-to-one -one correspondence. Now, despite them not being one-to-one co -one correspondence, can I still learn something from this data, right? I know a little bit, because I know there's two types, right? One is daytime, one is nighttime. Is this sufficient? for me to learn how to translate a daytime image to a nighttime image. So the first thing you could try is basically take your conditional GAN as is and just feed in daytime images and ask a discriminator to, to check whether the generator is outputting nighttime images, right? So we're just training it as before, except that we're saying, yeah, input to the generator is a daytime image. And we're asking the generator to output images that are that it resemble nighttime images and the discriminator checks whether they do resemble nighttime images. Now you can do this. The problem is of course, that it, the discriminator doesn't know whether the nighttime image that the generator outputs actually has any resemblance in terms of content to the daytime image, right? All we're asking the generator to output a nighttime image, but we're not telling it to output a nighttime image that corresponds to my conditional input, right? So there's no mechanism in, in this, the way I presented it here so far, there's no mechanism that tells the generator that they need to be in correspondence, right? I'm just saying, I'll put nighttime images and you're free to choose any nighttime image you want. I haven't forced you to output a nighttime image that corresponds to the content of the daytime image. So how can we enforce, yeah, that there's a correspondence, right? That, that's the main, yeah. It's the main goal, right? I want nighttime images to correspond to my daytime image. So how do, how do we do this? Our, yeah, the main idea of, of UNIT, unsupervised image image translation, is the following assumption. The assumption is that there's a shared latent space. And the shared latent space basically corresponds to the content, irrespective of whether it's daytime or nighttime. It's sort of really like a scene representation, but it hasn't been yeah, lit or rendered yet. So what we want uh, is the following, right? 
if I have a daytime image, I want something like an encoder that encodes my daytime image into a location in the shared latent space Z. Then I want yeah, the same for the, for the nighttime. If I had a nighttime image that corresponds exactly to my daytime image, I would want yeah, the nighttime encoder to also encode it to the same location in my latent space as my daytime encoder. Because it means that yeah, these are in correspondence. The only difference between these two images is that one is yeah, during the day and one is at night. And then I can have a decoder on the other side, one for daytime and one for nighttime, which would just take yeah, this location in my shared latent space or this content that's represented by Z and output either a daytime image or a nighttime image. Right? And if I can enforce this type of shared latent space, then I'm done, right? Because then yeah, what well, I can map from yeah, domain one or domain two into a location corresponding to content. And then I can decode it in whichever yeah, uh, domain I want, domain one or domain two. Now, if I don't do any constraints, which is sort of what, what, what I yeah, showed briefly at the beginning, if I don't have any additional constraints, right, my encoder might encode yeah, this domain one image to a particular location Z. If I take the nighttime decoder, it might interpret this location differently, right? It might interpret this, this latent vector Z differently and output something that is, yes, a nighttime image, but doesn't correspond to the daytime image, right? That would, that, that's a problem. What I really want is this, this location Z to have a unique meaning for both daytime and nighttime. Our solution is actually, in, in, in a way fairly straightforward. What we do is for you know, both the daytime and the nighttime encoder and the daytime and the nighttime decoder, we force them to share weights near the shared latent space. What this means is that as a result, if they have to encode or decode, it sort of means that the content that they're encoding or decoding is the same independent or has to be the same independent of daytime and nighttime because they're sharing weights, right? Um, they, they don't, they're not given a choice to be different. They're only given a choice sort of in the later layers, which is sort of the part where they start to you know, either make it daytime or nighttime. And that is sufficient um, as a constraint uh, to make this work. So now I can encode my daytime image and get a corresponding nighttime image, even though I've never seen paired input. And of course, I can also reconstitute sort of the original data image. And this is actually part of the training loop that we ask yeah, the algorithm to go from yeah, the daytime domain, from the daytime domain back to the daytime domain, and then the same for the nighttime domain and, and so forth. And that, that in itself is sufficient to make this mapping happen. And here's what we get. So this is daytime to nighttime. Again, the input was never paired, but it learned many things. So it learned that you know, the sky is dark uh, at night, right? It learned that the road is illuminated, but it's darker than during daytime. It learned that the car colors are basically all black or gray. However, yeah, the taillights are illuminated, so it manages to illuminate taillights. It also uh, realizes or learns that sometimes there's lights in the background, right? So sometimes you can see that there's a light flickering or light coming up here as well. There's lots of you know, lights that it decides to put in. Not always at the location where they really are, right? Sometimes it, it mistakes a tree for where there might be a, a street lamp, so it puts a light there. But overall, it actually does remarkable for never having been told what corresponds to what, right? It's never actually seen a car during the day and a car during the night in one-to-one -one correspondence. Yet it somehow figured out that these are taillights and they should be illuminated um, at night. And this is the sky and this should be dark at night. We can do the same thing for, yeah winter to summer translation. So we have a, as input, yeah, winter driving images and it gets automatically translated to summer. And again, as before, it learned that where there's snow, there should be either grass or, or just you know, the shoulder. Where, yeah, there's sort of the gray sky, it learned that it might be blue sky and some clouds. Where there's barren trees, it knows to put leaves uh, on the trees. And, and again, it's never yeah, had one-to-one -one corresponding images, but it still learned um, to do this. There is some interesting things. Let me just find a good location. There's some interesting things that it, that it learns. Uh, so it's having a hard time distinguishing electricity poles and electricity lines from, from you know, barren trees, right? So here, if you look at this pole, it thinks, well, that sort of looks like a tree. 
and then adds leaves to it. And it's not a silly thing to do, right? Because they, it sort of looks like a tree, right? So it decides, yeah, that's probably a tree. So let's add some leaves to it. It's not correct, but also, yeah. It's also, yeah, understandable why, why it would think this, right? So here you can always see that when there is these electricity posts, it, it tends to add uh, leaves to it. And here we go from uh, sunny to rainy. And again, it's learned that the, gray, that the sky should be gray uh, during a rainy day. It also learned that the road should be you know, reflective. So it looks like the road is a bit more, uh, you know, ha has water on it and then it reflects the environment a little bit. And, and it also learned, you can sometimes see that when there's taillights that they, sh that, yeah, they sort of glow a little bit in, in the midst of the rain and, it, and it's managed to, to get that as well. So again, this is all from unpaired training data, it's managed to deduce you know, these things uh, automatically, which I think is, is really quite uh, surprising that it manages to learn this without ever having been explicitly told. This yeah, unit was uh, a method that only did sort of a, a unimodal translation, right? You get exactly one output out. Uh, we then later on, uh, following year, we, we um, have a follow-up work that, that manages to do a multimodal translation. So for a given input, you can have multiple potential outputs. So here we can go from yeah, summer to winter, but we can have different yeah, types of winter. Namely, it might be sort of yeah, during the day or maybe at dusk or dawn instead, right? So there's different ways you could have, you can imagine that yeah, summer image should translate to a winter image. And it's, it's similar in some sense to a uh, unit, except that we now use sort of a partially shared latent space, meaning the style we, we encode separately. So whenever we go from an image to our, our uh, latent space, we also you know, encode the style into a style space. And then at translation time, we yeah, take the content, um, but also a style that we can apply to get different potential outputs. And again, surprisingly, you can train this in an unsupervised fashion. So we never need to explicitly say that there's different styles. It learns to disentangle different styles automatically. And we do this by asking the network to, to learn sort of within domain reconstruction, saying, yeah, if I have an image, you should be able to decode it into style and content, and then yeah, resynthesize based on those inputs. Uh, and, and when you resynthesize, it should be back your original image. Now, that isn't sufficient as a constraint because you could disentangle style and content any which way you would want, right? It wouldn't necessarily need to correspond to style and content. However, we can, we can do this cross-domain reconstruction. This is really the main insight here. So if I have two images, one image from domain one, one image from domain two, I can say that I, I take domain two image, I get its content, I encode it into its content. I take the style, from the image one and apply it to, domain, to the image from domain two. So I translate X2 to domain one. And when I, again, encode this into style and content, the style should be the style of one, domain one, and the content should be the content of domain two and vice versa. I can go from domain one to domain two. And that adds enough constraints for the network to be able to disentangle style from content by doing this cross-domain reconstruction. Network itself, uh, very similar uh, to, to the other networks before, except now that we need to encode the style somehow and give it to the generator. And we, we do this using you know, adaptive instance normalization, uh, which again is sort of you know, uh, similar to batch norm, but the parameters are learned. And, and that works yeah, quite nicely. So <clears throat> what we can do here, um, is we go from images of edges of shoes to actual shoes. So in this case, we have the ground truth. We didn't use it for training, but we have it so we can actually compare with ground truth. So here's some yeah, example translation. So input is edges, and the network learns to output different styles of shoes, right? And they're reasonable. There's a pink one, a black one, a beige one, and they're sensible. For the sneakers, it learned that because there's these little edges here, it learned these are probably you know, two these might be two different colors, right? It might be white and blue, or it might be a, a leather shoe, or it might be black and white, which is reasonable. And then here for the patterned uh, bag, 
it's learned that yeah, these might be colorful or they might be a bit more you know, monochrome or monochromatic. And th these are reasonable translations, right? They're not like the ground truth, but it's never seen the ground truth, but it does a reasonable imitation of what a bag might look like that has edges like this. Then we can also translate you know, um, synthetic to real and real to synthetic images. So you, we have a real input, uh, real driving video, and we used Cynthia images to go from cityscape to Cynthia. So this is what the real images looks like, and this is what potential game-like images would look like to correspond to this input. So we have sort of a snowy or a rainy day, uh, a snowy day, and here is a, 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 a sunset. Here we go the other way around. We have a Cynthia image, and we create sort of realistic renditions of the Cynthia image that look more like cityscapes. And again, we can do the, the same way we did before. We can go from summer to winter and from winter to summer. And the network has learned that when we go from summer to winter, there might be more or less snow on the road. And when we go from winter to summer, trees might have more or less leaves on the trees. So we managed to disentangle that. And of course, we can do yeah, some, some funny things like translate dogs to cats. So this is just trained on a, on a data set of dogs and cats. And since this is multimodal, we can now synthesize multiple different cat breeds that correspond to the dog. And since we can just apply it on a video, so whatever the dog does, yeah, in this case, flapping its ears, the cats will do too. But we have different renditions of cats because yeah, the network realized that there's different styles. We can do other things like interpolate between house cats to big cats. Sorry, we're going from house cats to big cats or big cats to house cats in this case. And we can sort of walk the latent space and sort of just interpolate different styles in our space and go through different dog breeds, which probably is hard to see on, on the video feed. And once we have this, we can sort of span the whole matrix of content and style. So if I have different content, I can take different styles and, and create the whole matrix of content to style. So I can see any of the shoes in any of the style and build the whole matrix up in the same if we go from big cats to house cats, which I think is, is quite neat um, actually. So let me, uh, in the interest of time, let me skip one of the examples and go uh, to this because it ties in, um, it ties in some of the learnings um, that we had to something that's that's, yeah, not about synthesis, but we, we use the same ideas to apply it to segmentation, which I think to some people in the audience might might be of interest. So let's say you have the case where you would like to be able to segment um, a tumor from sort of healthy cells. So in this case, uh, it, it's a scan, right? And he, on the left, you can see the liver is in red and the tumor has been um, segmented in green. Now, and you can train, of course, the neural network to, to try and, and do the segmentation automatically. If you train this in a supervised fashion, then that's, that's really ex expensive in terms of labeling because now you need you know, specialists, doctors um, who know what they're looking at to label you know, many thousands of or you know, thousands of, of these images for, for a network to be trained. And that's very labor intensive and, and difficult to achieve. So now can we apply our learnings of you know, maybe use you know, data that's, that's unsupervised or, or you know, very weakly supervised where I get scans and all I, I know is whether you know, this particular scan does have a tumor in it, uh, and this particular scan does not have a tumor in it. And then maybe a little bit of data with actual full segmentation labels. And this is interesting because it's a lot easier to label an, uh, yeah, a scan, whether it has cancer or not, instead of having to yeah, segment it uh, painstakingly. And, and you can probably always see where I'm going, right? Because uh, these images are, are sort of a, a scan with cancer and a scan without cancer. It's sort of like an image to image translation problem, if you will, or you can phrase it as such. And this is exactly what we did. So given an input image, which has yeah, a tumor in it, so it's, it's present, we use an encoder to encode it or translate, translate it into the absence domain, meaning into a scan uh, or into an equivalent scan without the tumor in it. And 
we also encode sort of what yeah, the, the uh, residual is between the two, namely where would the tumor bit be? And it also allows us to yeah, simultaneously output a segmentation map that corresponds to this. And then, yeah, if I use the, the transformed image to image uh, translated scan, plus the residual one, which contains you know, the difference, if I you know, add them back up, I should get back the present domain image. This is very, very similar to this unsupervised image to image translation in, in some sense, right? And we can train this um, in, similar, in a similar fashion. And then what we get is the following. So here we've used sort of one percent fully labeled data, which is sort of trained in a supervised fashion. And then sort of lots of data that's unsupervised. And but then what we can do is, is learn things like this, right? So we have the input where it's cancer present. Um, we automatically get a segmentation out uh, compared to the ground truth segmentation, even though we only use sort of you know, very few actual labeled data, and most of it was in an unsupervised labeled in an unsupervised fashion, meaning. Yeah, it, it just had present versus not present as a label. And then, yeah, in terms of results, this is what you get um, with 1% of annotations for segmentation. We tried this on, on sort of synthetic data set, which is MNIST, and then we also tried it on, on the sort of commonly used BRATS uh, data set. If you only use segmentation as the label, uh, we get, you know, for, for the BRATS data set, uh, 0.69. If you use sort of pure autoencoder as a baseline, which is commonly used, you can get 0.73. If you use our proposed method, the less is image to image translation uh, idea, then you get 0.79. This is still ongoing work, so, so I don't think we're quite uh, finished. Uh, the setting here was just a 2D you know, slice single channel, um, so maybe not you know, the, the most realistic um, yeah, scenario. But for this scenario, we got encouraging uh, results. So, <coughs> excuse me. With that, um, I would like to conclude. So I've, I've presented um, pix to pix HD and video to video, which are sort of supervised methods um, for translating uh, images. I showed you, you know, so the follow-up, Gaugan, which are artistic tools uh, for, for creating landscapes. Then I showed how we can use or do unsupervised image to image uh, translation, uh, also in a multimodal fashion, and to show how we can apply this to other use cases, uh, such as segmentation. And of course, you know, I, I didn't do this work myself. Um, I, I would like to thank all, all uh, you know, my collaborators, uh, of which there are many, you know, many of those are people within NVIDIA, but also, of course, you know, people, uh, external collaborators at, at various uh, universities. And with that, I would like to thank you uh, for attending my talk and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Jan. Uh, that was really amazing. There were lots of amazing pictures and as well as videos. Um, I'm really happy about that. Um, you also um, yeah, nicely showed how um, you can use a method which actually takes ages for training and turn that into something that interactively is actually useful and fun and uh, <laughs> can do some stuff. And if you look at the uh, Discord channel, actually, you already see that um, some people went ahead and already created their famous uh, recreation <laughs> pictures. So it's a really cool that it's lots of fun. And one of the questions that has been asked uh, particularly is also for um, what is it uh, like, I mean, what do you think how AI and art actually will interact in the future? Right, that, that, that's, that's a really good question. So with, with what we've done, right? It, it's not that the AI really creates art, right? It, it doesn't extrapolate, it, it, yeah, it basically only interpolates. So it doesn't actually create sort of new things. It creates only sort of, yeah, mix, mixed versions of things that is, that it's, Seen. So I think AI will, will be useful as a tool for artists to enhance uh, what they're doing. I don't think it will supplant them in, in any way, but it really is, I see it as a tool to enable artists to be more productive. Cool. Um, that, then related to that, actually, um, like, I mean, we are, we are getting better and better with these uh, gun style images, like producing yeah, images which have never been real. 
And of course, there's this fear uh, that with these fake images, you can easily support uh, also fake news. Um, and then it's even clear because they generate this way that even a machine cannot tell them apart. Do you have any idea of like how, how this can be um, used or prevented? Or what yeah, right. It, it certainly is a problem. And, and of course, we don't want that as a use case, right? Or, or yeah, we, we want to avoid people or prevent people from using it in, in nefarious ways, if at all possible. At the moment, I think it's actually still possible for a machine to tell whether yeah, an image has been synthesized or not. And if you look at the Stallion 2 paper, there's some ideas on, on how to do uh, that. So basically, yeah, if you, re if you take an image and you reproject it and, and you basically try and find a latent code that corresponds to it and resynthesize it with a GAN, if you get the same image back, well, then it's probably been synthesized. So there, there's ways of, of figuring um, this out. Um, ultimately, uh, it, it is a challenging question in this. The, Lots of other groups, and, and now at NVIDIA too, where we look at how can we find sort of how can we can we devise automatic methods to detect yeah, deep fakes um, so we can label them in some way or another. Okay. Um, if, if you look at um, some of the images, particularly the slightly earlier work, um, some of the artifacts that have been generated by the guns are really obvious to human. Like, for example, there's uh, some, some object boundary going right through something which clearly should belong to exactly the same object or something like that, or, or some, some things appearing at places in the world where they clearly shouldn't be. Um, is, is there, do you have any idea of how to go about these kind of artifacts? I mean, they've been much, much better, for example, in the video part, for example, where, where they really were significantly more consistent. I, I think, so uh, there's probably multiple answers. So one thing, in the earlier work, I think it's just fundamentally very challenging. Because if you look at the label maps themselves, right, they're not very expressive. So if you look at so buildings, it's one label that says all of this is the building. It doesn't actually tell you where the windows are or anything, right? So there's a lot of freedom for the network to, to hallucinate things that it thinks are right. But it hasn't really given a lot of information to base its, its you know, hallucinations on. And as a result, you, know, you, you see all these kinds of artifacts, right? Um, I think what I'm saying is that in order you know, to get better results, you, you might need, you might just need more constraints or possibly a lot more data so the network can actually learn what these constraints should be. But in the absence of lots of data, you might just need more input um, to make it work. Okay, very cool. Um, the other thing is, um, You've mentioned um, like also like training for for video to video translation, and of course one big issue like working with videos is that that your memory on the graphics card is always somehow limited, particularly if you then have high resolution videos. I mean you have this amazing work of how to make guns and all work for HD resolution. Um, what is your your take on how to train with big video data? <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean one, one answer is. It, it's a bit of engineering work to, to make it happen, right? It's true. I mean, uh, many of these networks or, or some of these networks require a lot of memory. Um, so if you have yeah, not enough, it becomes a bit of a challenge. Now, if you're in the lucky position to have multiple GPUs, you can put them together and you can sort of yeah, expand your memory by using multiple uh, GPUs. That's, that's one way or you know, some form of distributed training. Um, so you just increase the size of memory. There's other engineering tricks like, you know, saving checkpoints when you, when you go through your network instead of you know, keeping everything in memory. So th there's things you can do which might slow down your training, but at the same time, yeah, at least you can train um, at that point. So I think there's engineering solutions, I guess is, is my short answer to, to make it still work. It's, yeah, it takes a bit of work to make it feasible or just buy a GPU with a bigger memory. <laughs> <That's the easiest. laughs> I, I know a window for that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, great. Um, thank you so much, Jan, for, for this very inspirational uh, talk with a lot of cool demos and then 
also far-reaching applications of it. Um, yeah, this concludes actually our keynote speech for today. Um, the next um, yeah, items on, on our program actually are the general assemblies, both of the DATM as well as of the um, yeah, Fachbereich uh, Graphische Datenverarbeitung, the German uh, Computer Graphics Association. For the DAGM assembly, um, all members already should have gotten an email um, stating which Zoom link to use there. And for the uh, graphics community, um, there's now a link in the uh, Discord channel if you haven't received an invitation already. Okay, so see you there in the Zoom rooms in a few minutes. And once again, thank you, Jan, for this great presentation. Thank you. And thank you all for listening.